here we go. It's time to go to film school with film study professor Joe Fortunato, who joins us on Fridays here on the show. And we're going to do a little science fiction for you today. Blockbuster movie, though. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. And Joe, why don't you take it from there, my friend? Well, good morning, Ray. Good morning, everybody. And absolutely, we're going to do one of my favorite films, uh, Close Encounters of the Third Kind, uh, which was released November 15th, 1977. It was directed by Steven Spielberg, also written by Steven Spielberg with help from uh, some other folks. Uh, it starred Richard Dreyfus, of course, Terry Garr, Melinda Dillon, and famed French director Francois Truffaut in one of his only acting roles, one of the few that he did. It won one Oscar for uh, cinematography. It had seven nominations um, for, among others, supporting actors, director, uh, art direction, sound, editing, <clears throat> and some others. And uh, Ray Bradbury, the famed uh, science fiction writer, declared this the greatest science fiction film ever made. Um, so, of course, that's a matter of opinion, but uh, Ray Bradbury's opinion probably counts more than a lot of ours. It was included in the AFI's list of 100 greatest movies. Um, it had a budget of $20 million, which was pretty sizable at the time, but went on to become one of the top grossing films of the 70s. Uh, the movie raised 15 times its cost, so it was very successful. The irony is that it uh, not only came out the same year as Star Wars, but it opened the same week that Star Wars overtook Jaws as the biggest blockbuster of all time. Now, one of my favorite stories, and I kind of wanted to save this for the end, but since I'm just sort of launching into it now, I will. One of my favorite stories about this is that uh, Spielberg and George Lucas, uh, who were good friends, were working on these movies simultaneously. Keep in mind that you know Star Wars had not come out and been the big blockbuster yet that it would become. And uh, so they're on, you know, uh, Lucas is visiting um, Spielberg on the set of Close Encounters, and, there's, and he's saying, oh, your movie's going to be better than mine. Mine's not working. And Spielberg's going, oh, no, your movie's going to be great. Mine's not working, whatever. They go, hey, I'll tell you what. Let's exchange points. And points are like a percentage of the gross. He goes, all right. So they exchange a couple of points each. So Spielberg got a couple of points on Star Wars. Lucas got a couple of points on uh, Close Encounters. And... That was it, and it's, it's from this day forward, uh, Spielberg still makes money off of Star Wars because of the exchange points, so that was quite lucrative for him. Well, you, you mentioned uh, Close Encounters, and then you also mentioned Jaws in the same breath, and both of those movies had Richard Dreyfus in it, and both of those movies had the Dreyfus-Spielberg uh, connection. Yeah, and Dreyfus, uh, you know, has, has gone on to work with, Spielberg a number of times is, um, you know, so he's uh, definitely uh, sort of almost a stand-in for Spielberg as a, as a character. Um, Spielberg, or, I mean, uh, Dreyfus kind of lot when he heard uh, Spielberg talking about this, he kind of lobbied for the role, but um, they didn't really want him. He thought he was a little too young for the role at the time. And, uh, but he kind of begged and, and uh, they offered it to a number of other people Um uh, Al Pacino, Jack Nicholson, Gene Hackman, um, and so on and so forth. James Kahn was suggested by the studio. Anyway, they went back to Dreyfus and cut his deal back a bit because he was asking for too much. And, uh, of course, he got the role, and, and he's immortalized in the film as Roy Neary. Um, so, uh, and, and by the way, Steve McQueen also turned down the role because he said he wasn't able to cry on film. <laughs> Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1970s. Terry Garr, also, this was probably at the, quote, height of her career. She plays Richard Dreyfuss' wife in the movie. Yeah, and, you know, the irony of, uh, of, of that, uh, and she had been acting for a long time. She actually, uh, some sci-fi fans might know she had a role in the original Star Trek. So, and she'd been, and, and of course, uh, Young Frankenstein and, and other things like that. Um, but in that, in that same year, in 1977, this is the second of two times that Terry Garr played a woman who was married to a man who was sane but considered crazy because he sees something that no one else saw. Uh, the other one was Oh God with John Denver. Um, <laughs> so kind of a, a weird little piece of trivia uh, for her. Um, some of the other actors, the young, the young boy, uh, Gary Cuppy, uh, Guppy, was so um, good in the role 
Stanley Kubrick was so impressed by him that he wanted him to play Danny in The Shining, uh, but he couldn't get him because of scheduling conflicts. Um, so there's a number of other fun things. The, uh, um, the, the, little, the aliens that emerged from the mothership at the end um, were all little girls from a local ballet club because uh, they wanted to use little girls instead of boys because they thought they were more graceful, and the, and the ballet uh, experience gave them a little bit more grace. One of the early concepts, and this goes to show you how fun and crazy filmmaking can be, one of the early concepts for the aliens was to have uh, orangutans on roller skates. Um, but that didn't work because the orangutan was very frightened the second the roller skates uh, touched the ground uh, and kept grabbing onto his caretaker. So that didn't really go well. Um, the, the, the music is so indelible in this film. Yeah. Uh, the iconic five-note melody uh, was just a chance arrangement um, that John Williams and, and Spielberg happened upon after hundreds of different permutations. Um, the tuba player is the musical voice of the mothership in the climactic scene where the ship comes down to Devil's Tower. Mm-hmm. And they chose the tuba because uh, it was the difficulty of playing that instrument added sort of a human characteristic to the aliens. So the tuba kind of takes on the voice of, of the aliens. And the film originally ended with a version of When You Wish Upon a Star from Pinocchio. But that tested negatively uh, in the previous one was cut. However, if you listen to, the, to John Williams' great score, at the end, when Roy is getting on the mothership, uh, there's a little snippet of When You Wish Upon a Star kind of ingratiated into as a motif into the soundtrack, and it's a just a wonderful moment. Joe, let me ask you this. Where did they do a lot of that desert filming? Was that out in California, in the deserts out there? Where did they take the production? <laughs> well, of course, they shot the actual Devil's Tower um, uh, as a location, uh, and they chose that over uh, some other uh, more familiar um, you know, Western locations like John Ford had used because they thought that those were sort of overused, so the Devil's Tower was very unique in its structure. Um, and then, by the way, the film is shown every night at Devil's Tower Campground, so it uh. makes this one of the most screened movies ever. Um, and uh, it was the first national monument ever established by President uh, Theodore Roosevelt, too, so uh, that's kind of fun. Um, however, the entire s- the, the set of the Mothership Landing Strip mm-hmm. uh, behind Devil's Tower, that was constructed and filmed in, a, in an aircraft hangar in uh, Mobile, Alabama. So we were across the country for that. Very secretive set. Uh, they were afraid people would watch on. Spielberg called it one of his most difficult directing assignments uh, ever. Uh, he said, "Boy, I thought Jaws was bad. This is uh, this is even worse." I don't know if that's true or not, but uh, <laughs> that's how Spielberg felt. Uh, you know, the other thing about just to kind of show you how um, connected uh, art is to the director, uh, Spielberg very often called this one of his more personal movies. It was based on a film that he did as a kid. Uh, and he revamped it to, to uh, modernize it. Um, but uh, he originally, and I'm you know, giving a spoiler here, but it's an older film, uh, you know, Roy Neary, Richard Dreyfus gets on the mothership and, and leaves his family, and Spielberg said if he had made it today, he wouldn't have done that because now he's a father and a husband, and he wasn't at the time. Uh, so, uh, you know, that's uh, um, something that... Uh, you know, would have changed if he had made this in a different part of his career. Joe Fortunato taking us to film school back to 1977. The iconic movie. Maybe pull that one out this weekend. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Great stuff again, Mr. Fortunato. We'll reconnect next Friday morning. Thank you for your time. Thanks, everybody. Have a great weekend. 23 minutes after 8, WAKR.